Hi, my name is Karen Deep Singh. I'm an assistant professor of learning health sciences, internal medicine, urology, and information at the University of Michigan. And I'm excited on behalf of our research group to present ClinSpacy, an R package for clinical natural language processing using Spacy, SciSpacy, and MedSpacy. Historically, clinical NLP has been fairly Java-centric. Most of the existing technologies have relied on the Apache Unstructured Information Management Architecture, also known as UEMA, that was adopted from IBM. And two prominent examples of UEMA-based software include Metamap and Apache CTIX. Metamap was developed by Dr. Alan Aronson at the National Library of Medicine, and Apache CTIX was developed by a team of researchers at the Mayo Clinic, and then eventually turned into an Apache project. While both of these tools are really powerful, they require a lot of configuration, and they don't seamlessly integrate with data science languages like R and Python. A couple years ago, a Python package became available that has been turning things on its head in the space of natural language processing, and that was Spacy. So in contrast to UEMA, Spacy was relatively easy to set up. It was available readily in Python, supported multiple languages, had multiple pre-trained pipelines available, uh, had easy integration with neural networks, and came with pre-trained word vectors. And with the rise of natural language processing in uh, the space of machine learning and neural networks, uh, the ability to have pre-trained word vectors was a huge plus that simply wasn't there in kind of other clinical natural language processing uh, pipelines at the time. So with all these kind of features uh, and with the fact that it was you know, fairly fast uh, in the way that it was built, uh, it's started to see a lot of wide adoption in Python. And Spicy can do a lot of things that clinical NLP tools simply just can't do. In contrast to the uh, UEMA-based tools, which were fairly difficult to set up uh, and required a lot of dependencies to be kind of figured out, as well as, you know, the right Java version, uh, Spacey was fairly easy to install. You can install it right from within pip in Python, you know, to the extent that anything in Python is easily installable. This is about as easy as you can get in terms of Python installation. There was also already uh, interfaces opening up from Spacey to R, and this was evident in the Spacey R package. That's fantastic. And also in other R packages like Clean NLP uh, that support interfaces to Spacey. As I mentioned earlier, Spacey supports entity vectors or embeddings, which we'll talk about a little bit more later in the talk and support for multiple language models. And all of this stuff, all of this has led Spacey to have a fairly fast and growing ecosystem. So if you go to the Spacey website and you look, look at their universe, you'll see that there's several you know, packages out there available in Python and other languages that, that are built on Spacey, including Clean NLP, which was one of the uh, packages I mentioned earlier that provides an interface to Spacey from within R. However, Spacey is not sufficient on its own for clinical NLP. Uh, you know, if you look at this uh, output here from the Spacey R package that's wrapping uh, Spacey, you'll see that you know, the Spacey package is great for identifying tokens, identifying lemmas, part of speech and entity, but it can't recognize clinical en en entities. So you can't see it here, but the basic you know, English language model that comes with Spacey isn't specifically built for clinical or biomedical text. So for example, it's not going to parse uh, chronic kidney disease as a single entity, and rather it will give it uh, separate entities. It also can't map uh, phrases to the Unified Medical Language System, or UMLS codes. UMLS is a metathesaurus. Basically, uh, you can think of it as a dictionary that wraps other dictionaries that tries to tie together multiple different commonly used clinical dictionaries. And so without support for UMLS, you know, Spacey just can't cut it as a alternative to existing clinical NLP tools on its own. It also can't re recognize negations and hypotheticals. And if you've read clinical notes, you know that there's lots of situations where things are used either hypothetically or phrases are used with negations. For example, 
you know, part of the workup for, you know, someone who comes in uh, with, let's say, shortness of breath is to figure out if they have chest pain. So it's not uncommon to see an assertion of a sentence saying the patient denies chest pain, in which case we assume that the patient does not have chest pain. Similarly, if someone comes in, comes in with chest pain and they get a CT angiogram, the reason for that CT angiogram might be to rule out a pulmonary embolism. The phrase rule out PE doesn't mean that they have a PE. It just means that a PE is possible. And so it's uncertain whether, whether or not they have a PE. Psi Spacey and Med Spacey are additional Python packages that add functionality to Spacey that help quite a bit. Psi Spacey was developed by the Allen Institute for Artificial Intelligence. It brings biomedical language models to Spacey, including entity vectors and embeddings that are specific to clinical terms and biomedical terms. Psi Spacey also includes a UMLS entity linker, which means that it has the ability to link phrases to UMLS codes. This is exciting because it means that, uh, assuming that the mapping is done correctly, that the phrase for CKD would get mapped to the same UMLS code as the phrase for chronic kidney disease. MedSpace was developed by a highly experienced research team, uh, or a highly experienced research team, including folks at University of Utah. Um, and it incorporates several uh, pieces. The pieces that we use in ClinSpacey are the context algorithm, which detects negations and hypotheticals, as well as references to family members, uh, as well as a sectionizer, which tries to figure out uh, which section of a note uh, a given uh, concept or entity is found in. For example, a patient who uh, has a medication listed under, under the medication section of a note might just mean that that is a medication that patient already takes, whereas a medication listed under the plan would mean that that's a medication perhaps that's being newly prescribed. But Psi Spacey and Med Spacey also are incomplete. Neither package directly converts annotations to a tidy data frame format, which would be one row per entity. There is a Python package called dframec, which uh, does this, but not anything in R. And neither package uh, nor Spacey itself supports transformation of data from a one row per entity format to a one row per patient format. And so if you have a data set that looks like this with two patients, one of whom is 58, the other is 42, uh, with a systolic blood pressure and a phrase containing their history. If you're going to you know, build the, a prediction model out of this, you're going to need to convert it to a format where each of those entities in the history column becomes a separate column uh, with a count of how many times that showed up. So neither size spacey or med spacey can do this out of the box. And notice here how uh, you know, the patient has no hypertension and we want that to be uh, recognized as a HTN value of zero, even though the phrase HTN or the word HTN shows up in the history. So this is where it's important for the negation detection to work so that we can you know, uh, not include things that are negated, or if we want to include them, that we can set that manually. So the goals of ClinSpace here are pretty simple. We want to make setup and installation easy for all the Python components. We want to make annotation of clinical text simple. We want to make the results tidy. We know that processing of many items can be slow, so we want to make it easy to write the results to file and make it easy to then pipe these file names directly into other functions. And then we want to be able to create this one row per patient format by binding the kind of uh, results onto the original data frame. And this binding took inspiration from the tidy text bind tf idf function which binds the term frequency, the inverse document frequency, and the TF-IDF onto the existing data frame. Except in ClinSpacey, we have two functions that do this. One function is called bind ClinSpacey, which supports one column per entity. In this case, for example, diabetes would be a column, hypertension would be a column, and the values of those cells would represent the counts for each of those uh, uh, entities. And we also wanted to support entity vectors, vectors so that we know that you know, if a patient has diabetes and hypertension, each of those map to a, a certain dimensional vector, and we want to be able to take the averages so that we can have essentially one row per patient uh, as our final format for modeling. And then of course we want to make working with UMLS data easy um, if your machine has the appropriate RAM to be able to handle size spaces, 
UMLS entity linking requirements, which it turns out is actually 12 gigabytes. All right, so let's look at uh, ClinSpacey under the hood. So once you've installed ClinSpacey uh, and you library in ClinSpacey, you'll get this message where ClinSpacey is just telling you that by default, if this is your first time installing ClinSpacey, that when you initialize ClinSpacey, it's going to install Miniconda and install uh, uh, the ClinSpacey Conda environment, as well as all the dependencies within that environment. If you want to override this behavior, you can. But we're going to go ahead and just use the default ClinSpacey init function to get things initialized. So what does ClinSpacey uh, init do under the hood? It makes setup and installation easy. So first it installs uh, Miniconda, uh, or like I said, you can override this if you want. It configures a new virtual Conda environment called ClinSpacey. It installs the correct package versions, which is no small feat. There are multiple version dependency uh, issues uh, between SciSpacey and MedSpacey. So for example, SciSpacey uh, supports Spacey 3, but MedSpacey does not. So ClinSpacey init takes care of all those uh, versioning issues, including the correct versions for the SciSpacey language models. In general, you should install ClinSpacey from CRAN, uh, but right now the latest version of Miniconda, uh, which installs Python 3.9, is actually incompatible with Spacey 2.3.0. And so for right now, I would recommend using the uh, GitHub version of ClinSpacey, but this should be fixed in ClinSpacey 1.0.3 which should be submitted to CRAN relatively soon. So once you run ClinSpacey init, you'll see it working its magic. Here it's installing all the dependencies. And several minutes later, it finishes up installing dependencies and it loads and imports SciSpacey, Spacey, and MedSpacey into a pipeline and loads up the default large scientific language model. All right, so the first goal of ClinSpacey is to make annotation of clinical text simple. So if we feed in just a simple vector, this patient has diabetes and CKD stage three, but no hypertension, we get back a data frame where you can see that it's one row per entity. Um, here, there's no mapping to a UMLS code, it's just the entity and the lemma, and then some facts about it that come from the MedSpacey package around you know, whether it's historical, hypothetical, or negated. And if you look down here, you can see that hypertension is picked up as being negated. If you feed ClinSpacey a vector with multiple uh, items in it, then by default, it'll assign different ClinSpacey IDs to those multiple items. So here you'll notice that diabetes mellitus and DM actually get assigned different entities because in ClinSpacey's, uh, or rather in SciSpacey's uh, default language model, those were assigned two different entities, even though they might be referring to the same thing. You can also choose to give a data frame right into ClinSpacey. And if you do that, um, and you provide ClinSpacey with a DF underscore call argument to tell it which uh, column contains the text data, it'll actually process it and give you the same exact output as we got before. This is beneficial um, because then you can actually, uh, you know, refer to identifiers that are already in your data set. So for example, if you had a row ID, uh, like the ID column here, and you provided the argument of df underscore ID, you could actually uh, process the output the same way, except now the ClinSpacey ID refers to the existing identifier in your data set. There's two types of diabetes here. Uh, you know, there's type one diabetes and type two diabetes in medicine, which is not what this is about. Uh, what you know, we're trying to disambiguate is DM from diabetes. And there's really two ways that we can do this. One way we can do this is to map all entities to UMLS uh, CUIs, which are the UMLS codes. Or, you can, or we can try to map the entities into a vector space where hopefully DM and diabetes mellitus are sitting close to each other. Let's first try mapping all the entities to UMLS codes. How do we do this? We first turn the linker on. Uh, this is the UMLS entity linker by rerunning ClinSpacey init. Make sure you have enough RAM available before you try doing this. And once we've turned the linker on and then we uh, 
run the same function earlier uh, with Clint Spacey and pointing out which column contains the text, you can see that we get this huge mess. We get, um, you know, PT maps to Portugal, PT maps to positron, positron emission tomography or PET scan. Uh, the one thing PT doesn't map to is patient. Diabetes mellitus gets correctly mapped to the uh, definition. And if you look at HTN and CKD, here it's pretty cool because you can see that it correctly maps those to hypertensive disease and chronic kidney disease respectively. But did we at least fix the DM issue? And it turns out we didn't. Um, so DM here is picked, thought of as being potentially referring to dextra, uh, dexta, dexamethasone or dextromethorphan, uh, but not to diabetes mellitus. So NAT linking isn't perfect. It's slow. Uh, we can remove some extraneous mass matches by restricting by semantic type, but lots of mismatches remain and it struggles with abbreviations and disambiguation. So my personal preference is to, is to keep the linker off, but it depends on the task. So how do we put these predictors in a model? Clint Spacey returned a one row per entity uh, output, uh, but to build a model, we want a one row per patient output. To put our predictions in a model, we can now use the Clint Spacey init, uh, where we'll turn our linker off, and then we'll use the bind Clint Spacey function. The bind Clint Spacey function does exactly what it sounds like. Uh, it takes your Clint Spacey output and then uh, adds a column for each one of those uh, entities that I, it identified. Uh, and in this case, it uses the lemma. That's why everything is lowercase. And then those, rep those numbers represent counts. Um, because things only showed up either zero times or one time, you're seeing only zeros and ones. Again, it didn't quite solve our diabetes mellitus and DM issue as we expected, but otherwise, this is pretty close to what we wanted. We could also use uh, embeddings here. Um, and embedding is basically a multidimensional representation of a uh, entity. You could think of it as a points on a coordinate system. And the thought process here is that similar entities like diabetes, mellitus, and DM should be close to one another on this coordinate system. Here's an example of a three-dimensional word embedding where you can see that man and woman are close to each other and king and queen are close to each other. But also king and man and queen and woman are also uh, you know, close to each other or at least in the same direction as each other. So these word embeddings can capture really intricate relationships, not just in terms of the meaning of a word, but also its tense and its relationship to other words. Clint Spacey includes two sets of entity embeddings, the Psi Spacey entity embeddings, which are available when the linker is off, and the Kui Tevec embeddings, which are only available when the linker is on. Because size spacey embeddings are returned as part of the spacey pipeline, we need to explicitly request them when running clean spacey. So if you look at the code below, you'll see that if you want the size spacey embeddings, you have to set return size spacey embeddings as true. And you'll notice that the first three of 200 embeddings are shown in the screen below. Here they've been rounded off to two digits, although the actual embeddings are several digits longer. We turn these off by default for speed and memory reasons, but you can pretty easily get these as long as you specify uh, this argument in the Clint Spacey function. Even though DM and diabetes mellitus were assigned separate UMLS codes, when we look at them in the entity embedding space, and these are size spacey embeddings, we see that they're actually fairly close to one another. This is the code that shows you how you would uh, include just the first 10 embeddings as predictors um, using the bind Clint Spacey embeddings function mapping the output, um, and then linking it back to the text data so that you can kind of join those results back to the original file and then end up with one row per patient data. And then this also shows you, I won't go through it, how you can save your results to output files um, to save memory um, and also to be able to then pipe in those output files directly into the bind clean spacey functions. And this is actually my preferred approach. Clint Spacey is a precursor to recipes. Because things take a while, I don't recommend that you use it inside of recipes, but rather that you pre-process text before you send it to recipes. And for more details, feel free to take out, 
look at our GitHub page and our package documentation. Thank you.